So I want to talk to you about the toxicity warnings and the safety warnings to begin with before we get started. So um, first of all, our glazes, for the most part, are food safe. You guys are making functional pottery, and so with functional pottery, we're making food safe glazes. Um, however, that food safety is tested after they're fired. So this glaze here, and this glaze here, and this glaze here are ones that we can wash our SpaghettiOs out of and we can eat on, and if we leave food for a while, or if we wash them, in, wash them over and over again, the glazes won't change and they won't become damaged. However, oh, here we go. Uh, this one that I, I uh, glazed earlier today hasn't been fired yet. And this is not in any way food safe. You obviously wouldn't want to eat out of it directly. But it's also these glazes that we're working with potentially have some stuff in them that is not good for us to be eating around at all. So you notice I left my, well, I guess I left my drink in the other room. But no food anywhere around here. No drinks anywhere around here. If you go sit over there and you're working on, you've got a little cup of glaze and you're doing a little detailed glazing or something like that, no food. Buy that. So I come in the studio one day, and the student it has this, this fired piece sitting on the shelf, or on the table in front of her, and next to it she has those uh, cinnamon twists from Taco Bell, and she's brushing the edge of it because it got too thick. But this is called feathering when you brush a little bit of that clay off, but that glaze off. And that glaze is landing on her cinnamon twists. Not good to eat the cinnamon oh twists at that point. Um, we do not have lead in the studio. We do not have barium in the studio. Those are the two particularly toxic. You guys always hear, I'm sure you've heard people say, are they non-lead non glazes? We don't have lead in the studio, but that doesn't mean we don't have other stuff that is also bad for you. So chrome, copper, cobalt, when they're raw, aren't good things for us. You're not going to instantly die, but it, you, know, you don't want extended exposure. Also, there's clay in this glaze. And as we know, clay dust has silica in it, and we don't want to breathe that in. So whenever my students uh, mix glaze, we try to do it when folks aren't in here. When this is dry and I rub this, this is kicking up dust. Not a lot, but a little, and so we try to avoid that. Um, the other thing, the other um, less uh, dire uh, uh, warning, uh, but more immediate warning, is the staining warning. Some of these glazes have a lot have colors color into them now that will stain your clothes now. So if you've got shoes that are complex or shoes that are very light or light, I never wear light colored pants when I'm going to, you know, khaki pants or something when I'm going to um, glaze because it'll stain. Um, if you're worried about it, we can always put plastic bags on your shoes. You know, we can always put on any of the, the aprons and stuff like that. Um, and then did I have, oh, and then uh, sharpness. That was the other thing. So when you are... What glaze is, all of these glazes that we're talking about today, these are um, clay mixed with glass formers, which are silica, which is already in clay, but we add some extra. Um, there's, sometimes we add some colorant, sometimes we add some things that are fluxes, which make it melt sooner. These should sound familiar from clay bodies. We've just got more fluxes and more glass formers than clay. Um, and then sometimes we add things like opacifiers, um, which just make things opaque. Um, so they, they have, uh, they're not see-through, they're not transparent. And then this one we've added some stuff that makes the glaze pull apart differently. Anyway, in all of this stuff, one of those things is silica, which melts and forms glass. The outer surface of the glaze is glass, and when glass melts, when glass melts on the side of our pot, it's nice and shiny. When it melts down off the side of our pot and sticks to the shelf, we have to crack it off, and what we're left with is sharp glass, okay, that will cut you just as well as a glass bottle, a broken glass bottle will cut you. So um, be aware of that after we fire. I don't know why, but I always see students run their hand along the bottom of a pot that's just come out of the kiln, and they cut themselves. I mean, if it's, if there's a drip, it'll cut themselves. Even if you know you were completely careful in glazing your piece, occasionally it gets stuck and uh, there's a little bit of glaze from somebody else on the bottom. And so always check visually before you get around to checking with your hand. All right, I think that was my last warning. Um, so we are firing, uh, we, we're doing a glaze demo on the, um, the cone 10 glazes. These are mostly functional glazes. We also have um, some other kinds of firing techniques that we'll talk about later, which are mentioned in there. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, I said most of these glazes here, they're all cone 10 along here, um, most of them are food safe. 
All right, and the way you know they're not food safe is you take one of these test tiles. We've got a bunch of bowls that are test tiles over here, although I've pulled some of them down over here right now. Uh, you flip it over, it says Mary's Special Test Leeches, not food safe. This is not a food safe glaze. If you look for Mary's Special right here, if you look on the front of the bucket, it says not food safe right there on the front. This is the, so uh, a couple years ago we did a test, um, a set of tests where everybody glazed a uh, bowl, and the advanced students glazed bowls, and then we set either a lemon or some detergent in it, left them for a few days, and we then observed any changes. If the glaze changes a little bit, that shows us that it's not a stable glaze, it leaches a little bit, and potentially some of the chrome that's in this glaze comes off into your coffee or your SpaghettiOs or whatever you're eating out of it drinking out of it. So we determined that we couldn't say that this one was food safe. You know, I mean, the much as much as I'm handling it now, or if you have like a, you know, a sandwich on it for uh, 10 minutes or something like that, it's not going to instantly hurt you, but we don't want to advertise these or, or give these as things that we expect are food safe. The other one that is not food safe is over here, turquoise mat. It also says not food safe. We actually don't know. I've, uh, that one we haven't tested, I believe. Um, so we've just said that it's not food safe. The rest, for the most part, have been tested. Uh, I say for the most part, the garbage glaze is remixed every quarter. We can't, we don't test it every quarter. I suppose we could do a test, um, but we haven't done that yet. And then the last one that is not food safe of this batch is the Ninja Junior Crawl. It's a crawl glaze. And if you think about washing out your SpaghettiOs out of the inside of this, okay, I don't know why you're washing it out of a teapot, but, you know, if you're washing uh, something out of this glaze, um, it's going to be hard to clean. And that's why it's not food safe. It doesn't leach specifically, it's just hard to clean it. So all the rest of them are food safe, assuming you glaze them correctly. So the rest of this is going to be talking about glazing them correctly. All right, so I'm not going to glaze with Mary's right now. I'm going to glaze with this one here, Desert Sand, and then i got to remember my camera here. And then I think I'll grab Mark's Tomoku because it hasn't been mixed today. Um, I want you guys to come take a peek at these ones. Mark's Tomoku wasn't glazed today or mixed today. Um, Desert Sand was mixed earlier today. Take a look at the top of those guys. Notice how different Mark's Tomoku looks. What does it look like? Settled. Settled, yeah. So it's got that water sitting at the top. The desert sand has a very fine layer of water setting at the top, and these settle very quickly. So if you haven't mixed them in a day, or if you haven't mixed them in an hour or two, they're, they are going to settle some. So every time you come to start glazing with these, you need to mix them up. So these sticks are kept over there. Over here, there's a bunch of sticks, right? And take them out of the bucket, and before you uh, go to a store with them, check the end, check the sides, because if I have a little bit of Mark's Tomoku, this dark one, and I stick it in here, suddenly this glaze is a different glaze, all right? So I'm going to um, just stir with the stir stick. Um, these have all, everything except um, the one on the end there. Um, the uh, deep water blue has been mixed pretty recently by my work study, so they put it through a sieve. You guys might have seen them doing that at various points. Um, check my end. It's all clean. Um, and this one is already, uh, with just a couple of stirs, it's already at a nice consistency, sort of like milk. If you peek over the top here, you see how it's, um, how it's spinning. You can kind of see some of the thickness in there. This one, as I pull the stick up, um, I think I'm in camera. I don't know. Um, if I pull the stick up, um, you can see the chunks at the bottom. You keep stirring until all those chunks are gone. You also notice what I just did there? I splashed a little. Um, just to make sure I'm not splashing in the desert sand, I'm just going to scooch over a little bit. Also notice what I've did. What I've did. What I've done with the lids. I've leaned them against here. If you take this lid off and you put it over here, and then you put this lid over here, and then you forget, okay, which one it is, and I'm done, and then you grab the wrong lid and put it over the top, your other glaze, even if it doesn't look different, can contaminate. So if you keep the lids right with the pots, then they're not going to get swapped around. If they get swapped around, they do have the, the letters DS, Desert Sand, on them, so you can find them again. Um, all right, so I'm going to start to glaze.
anyways, and I'm looking in the top. This one looks like it's kind of uh, white, and this one looks like it's kind of red. So I'm sure that these glazes will just be red and white, right? No. So um, the glazes don't look anything like what they're going to look like later on. This one on the side here, and this one all the way through is Mark's Tomoku. Doesn't look particularly red. I mean, similar in some ways, maybe. Um, and then uh, desert, sand. desert Sand is right here. So they don't look how they're going to look later on. You need to go determine what they're going to look like. One of the ways you can determine is you can read here. When it's thin, it's tan with taupe speckles. When it's thick, it's off-white with subtle pink or green flashing. So if you look in here, you can see a little bit of subtle pink or green flashing where it's thick. Um, so if you're trying to determine what colors you've got, you can go over to the, the shelf above the metalsmithing soap and glaze sink here, and unless I've taken them, they usually are up there, and they say that they're a desert sand test or a deep water blue test, and sometimes they'll even have a nice hint like thin. It says thin right here. So you know that this one is fairly thin, and you've got to look for the thicker section here on this side to, to determine what that color might be like. If that's too hard or uh, they're missing for some reason, there are also test tiles here. Uh, I mean, um, this set of test tiles that are randomly tied really tightly together, I can look through and I found Tomoku. This is what my Tomoku tile looks like. I can also see how the thickness has changed a little bit. Tomoku tends to fall uh, to get thicker. Um, or where it gets thicker, it gets darker. And so if you put it on something like this that has a texture, or something like this, uh, something that has throwing lines, it'll uh, look different where the throwing lines are when they are, and where they are now. So you can check your test tiles here. You can check your test, tile, your test bowls over there. The test tiles that are over here are, um, are done in, they've been dipped twice. Oh, dusty. Um, they've been dipped twice. So this one has been, trying to find one that's our glazes. There we go. So this one has been dipped to that first line in whatever this first one is, MT. Any guesses? Marks, Tomoku, MT. And you can always check here, that's dirty, but MT, Marks, Tomoku. So the whole thing has been dipped in Marks, Tomoku, and then there's a, line, a second line up here, and then on top of the Marks Tomoku, after it dried, the top section has been dipped in FCR, which I happen to know is Faffy's Copper Red. You guys could look through these or ask. Um, notice that, I don't know if you can see the line that's right here, but the, the two glazes together have fallen past that line. These were all dipped the same, so they were all dipped to that line. So if it's fallen past that line, what I know is, okay, if I put Mark's Tomoku and Faffy's Copper Red together, that glaze is going to have some flow. It's going to move. So I know I don't want to put that, those two together at the very bottom of my pot because it's going to run off the side like this one did. Um, so you can use these test tiles as well. We've got a whole bunch of them. The main problem with those tiles is you're looking and looking and looking and looking um, for those. So we those put in layers, first one and then the other, like bake. You put one and then you bake it. Or you, you, you glaze, you let it dry, and then you dip again right oh. away. I'll show you that as I get into this. Um, the other way you can figure out what a glaze... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. One more, if, uh, one more before we get there. This is a glazing handbook. In the side of here is a whole bunch of stuff. The one I'm worried about right now is this glaze crib sheet. So if I fo follow along here, Mark's Tomoku is a satin color. It's opaque, not transparent. Uh, deep brown to black. Sounds about like that. And then over here some more information about it. So this is another one you could use. But the, uh, so all of those are good, useful sorts of things to get a sense of what that glaze looks like. You can also use this really complex technique. Hey Janice, what does Mark's Tomoku look like? Right, because Janice has been here a long time. Works for Hey Rachel, it works for Hey Les. Um, once you get into folks who have been here not quite as long, it, it, the, how well that works changes. Uh, but that is totally a legitimate uh, approach. Um, the other thing is that when I walk around the studio and I find this random cup that was up around the shelf somewhere, I look at this and I pretty much know what the glaze is. Um, and that's the case of uh, deep water blue with uh, probably some uh, white underneath it. Um, 
that pretty much works for uh, for the folks who've been here a long time. So that's if if you're walking around the studio and you say, "Man, that bowl over there looks great." Check the bottom. If it's not labeled, ask because it may be one we can help you with. All right, so I'm going to start to get ready to glaze, and I've got some choices here. I'm going to glaze this piece or this piece. Yeah, which one? The bowl. Why am I going to glaze the bowl and not this guy? Because that one hasn't been fired. Hasn't been fired yet. And the uh, the issue here, and I know I'm getting ahead of you guys because we haven't actually said that. But if I take this bone dry piece that hasn't been fired yet, and I dip it here in this bucket of water and other stuff, what might happen? It'll turn back into clay. It'll do what though? It'll, It'll slake. It. Yeah. It'll slake. Now, not necessarily. And here is where we're gonna we're gonna split from absolute truth to studio truth. Okay? In my studio, it is forbidden. Do not, absolutely, under any circumstances that I can think of, you should not be glazing uh, unfired work. You shouldn't be glazing green. If you go to some other studio sometime, they might have you do what's called a once fire, and you spray glaze on the surface of the, or even dip it on the surface of an unfired pot, and they'll let you fire it. It is a thing that exists in the world. It does not exist at YVCC Clay. All right. And the reason for that, reason for that is, well, there's several reasons. One is, I'm worried it might slick. This is the most fragile stage for clay. So did you get that question? Um, this is the most fragile stage for clay. If I drop, put it in here, and I bump it a little bit, it might break. But worse than that, it's too bad, you lost a pot, I don't really care. But worse than that, if you drop this in here, and for some reason can't get it out right away, one of the materials in this glaze is clay. If I put this in here and slake it, more of the materials in this glaze is clay, and suddenly the, cl the glaze is a different glaze because it has more clay in it. So, um, same if we just dropped a bunch of dry clay in there. So we don't want to do that. The second reason, even if you, oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to get one off on, on Rachel. I'm going to get ahead of her. I'm going to sneak it in here and put it in the on the shelf, and we'll fire it, and it'll be fine if I can get through this stage. And the problem with that is we glaze fire faster. So the, the, any moisture in here in a bisque kiln will get fired off and it won't blow up. Any moisture in here in a glaze kiln and it will probably blow up. All right. And uh, I speak from experience. Last year we had a student, I think it was last year, we had a student who either didn't understand or didn't listen and she took her piece that had been bounced out of the bisque firing. So, right, it wasn't fired in the bisque fire. She got some glaze on it. Somehow it didn't turn into mush. She put it on the shelf. It got loaded into the glaze kiln. Partway through the glaze fire, we hear a boom. And bits of, of clay shoot out the back hole of the, the kiln. And, of course, the reason we say I say clay is because we hadn't reached bisque te temperature yet. It blew up before bisque temperature. There's a bunch of students sitting there at the table, and they, they once they cool, they go over and pick them up, and they say, this looks like it's bone dry. And of course then they're fuming mad because they know they've got their pots in the kiln and suddenly little bits of glazed clay are inside of all of their bowls and stuff. So don't do that, right? All right, but we've got some a uh, bunch of bisque bowls here um, and uh, we, we have to do one other prep or we, we should at least think about one other preparation for getting these guys fired. Notice the bottoms of all of these pots over here. What do you notice about them? They're not glazed. They are not glazed. Because remember, glaze has glass, and even if it's not very shiny, that glaze melts. And the good news is it melts and it sticks to the clay. The bad news is it melts and sticks to everything else. So if you are unfortunate enough to have someone put a badly made um, uh, slab piece with an S that falls down next to your uh, part and thing in the kiln, then your glaze will stick to their, their S thing. And uh, and you will have a permanent addition to your sculpture. But also, <laughs> so who gets to keep that? huh? So if that's somebody's and that's somebody else's, who gets to keep that? Apparently the clay studio. Cause it's <laughs> in the clay studio. Um, so if you have glaze on the bottom, your glaze will stick to the shelf. And then when we take it, when we remove it from the shelf, we get to play the game of who gets to keep the glaze, the shelf or the pot. Um, so anyway, we keep the bottoms dry. We do what's called dry foot. Uh, we put dry feet into the into the kiln. So um, there's several ways to do this. One of the ways is we can just never get any glaze on the bottom. I can just very carefully not put any glaze on the bottom, and then I don't have to worry about it. 
But these other two methods are um, using wax. So um, this thingy here, this hot um, hot tray, I don't know, it's a thing that is hot. It gets hot. hot. Plug it in, um, and it melts the wax in this tray. Plug it in, turn it to warm. Don't turn it any hotter than warm. Um, and uh, and then I'm just going to take the lid off. It's going to start. The wax that's sitting in there is going to start to melt a little bit. Um, uh, that is one of the methods. Here is the other method. Um, so this is uh, pink wax, um, so named. It's actually pink. Uh, don't shake this up. It doesn't need. It doesn't settle. It's just water soluble wax. You can use this wax resist to uh, to put to to cover the part of your pot that doesn't want glaze on it. So I'm just going to paint this wax resist um, onto my foot. Um, people like the pink wax because uh, they can have a lot of control over where they put the wax. People don't like the pink wa wax because if you're not very steady as you're brushing it on, you don't put it where you want it. I am putting this wax on the bottom and on the foot. Um, some people put the wax in the inside, this space on the, on the foot. Um, I mean, on the on the bottom, but you don't. That's up. That's up to you. If it's really shallow there, you should add that. You should wax that section as well. So now, where this wax is, well, just let it dry. That wax is going to um, that wax is going to dry, and then it's going to act as a resist. It's going to not allow the glaze to absorb very well into there. Um, it is not a magical ninja attack thing that like shoots the glaze off of there. If you get some stuck on top of the wax, you still need to clean it off. And you just put it on the bottom instead of all around the foot? Or do you want to um, put it all around good the Good question, foot? yeah. So I put it on the bottom and up the foot for two reasons. One is, if the glaze has some flow, it may run down past that edge. And so if I put in something like the... Um, Mary's, uh, Faffy's Copper Red, the, the one that had dripped a lot in, the, in my test example that I can't find anywhere. Um, that one, uh, if I had that glaze go all the way to the edge of the foot, it would probably run down and stick to the shelf. Um, also, the foot is a logical place to end that glaze, to have that glaze stop right there. Um, and, uh, and so if it's a little thick, if it's a little uh, heavy, it'll, it has some room to, to drip past and it makes sense to end it. So, um, so anyway, this wax resist will uh, will dry, and then it'll keep the glaze from sticking. The, the pink wax is water soluble, so I'm immediately right away. It's so much easier if you do it right away. I'm gonna come over here and wash it off. Seriously, let it dry, and it's gonna be so much harder to uh, wash it off of there. All right, so my pink wax has, um, or I mean, sorry, my hot wax has melted, but I actually forgot to do something to prepare for this. So I'm not quite ready. These um, wax brushes have the melting wax in them, and these are now very hard brushes because that melting wax does not wash off of them. These are hot wax brushes. These are the only hot wax brushes in the studio. Do not add any hot wax brushes to my <laughs> studio because I don't want to take those brushes and put them in the hot wax because then they're permanently like this. Now, these are way too stiff to use right now. It'd be like just taking a stick. But, they've got hot wax in them. If I sit this in the tray thingy and I let that hot wax melt, it will soon be a flexible brush. Okay, so people always are like, oh no, I can't use these, they're hard, and they add another one in. If you do that, do that with your own brushes. Alright, so I got the wax on that one. I'm waiting for this brush to get ready. I could also just not put any glaze on that part of the pot. And so I think I'll show you that first. Find a good, good foot on this. Oh. <laughs> I want a kind of long foot because this is a little easier. All right. So I've mixed up the desert sand. I've got to mix up the. Um, excuse me, you do it. Uh, <laughs> I've got to mix up the other glaze a little bit. Um, all right. Even if you just are glazing for a little bit and then you step away, it's a good idea to still mix. Even even though this one was pretty well mixed. Um, it's still a good idea to, to run the stick back through it, even if you're just sitting for a little bit. All right, so I'm going to take this little uh, scoop. Now, never pick up a scoop off the table if you don't know what's in it and use it. 
Even if it's white, there are other glazes that look kind of white now. I happen to know I'm the only person glazing today, and so I know this is the right one. Okay, so I'm not going to contaminate this. But I wouldn't stick this over here, because that would contaminate. So I'm going to take a little scoop. Um, I'm going to pour it into here, and then I'm going to turn this, and I'm getting it right up as close as I can to the edge without actually getting to the edge. And then I'm going to pour it out. And now you see why I need a big foot here, so I can hold on to it. I'm holding it upside down. So I'm going to actually do this glaze, this this particular um, piece in two different colors of glaze, which is why I let the um, why I was getting this guy mixed up. So I'm holding it upside down so it doesn't drip, and stirring this at the same time. Um, so let me tell you while the, while I'm stirring this, let me tell you about hyenas in the studio. So it's a lot of work. To, am I out of picture? All right. Um, it's a lot of work to get the, um, the glazes stirred up. It's a pain in the butt. It's not fun. It's not your favorite day in this glaze studio. So when you, a great time to glaze is when three of your classmates or ten of your classmates or whoever is also glazing. Um, enough that, that you can split up and you can say, you, glaze, you stir that one, I'll stir this one. And enough that you can say, okay, I'll clean up these brushes, you clean up those sticks, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it is tempting to see someone else mixing and say, hey, hey they did all the work, I'm going to run in and, and uh, you know, take over. You're a hyena if you do that. You are, uh, they've done all the work of killing the, the beast of the glaze, and then you come in and, and just steal their scraps or whatever. So if you come in and you're going to glaze and you find, like, Amanda's already mixed up all three glazes that you want to use, come in, use the glazes, and then say, Amanda, can I help you clean up these sticks at the end of the day? Can I help you wipe off the table? Anything you want me to do for you? Um, it's super obnoxious to run in and just, just dip and run. Dip and run. <laughs> Alright, so this one that I dipped earlier is, uh, is getting dry. It's not, uh, as I touch it, it's not coming off on my hand. Um, it dries fairly quickly, right? So now I'm ready, to, and I can put it in another glaze now. I'm going to show you how to keep that foot clean. I'm going to keep my fingertips on this, and I'm going to press, put this down into the glaze, and then I'm just going to tip it, twist it a little bit, um, so that it gets a little on the rim. I'm holding it upside down. If my fingers are too weak, I'll stick my other finger underneath there to hold it. Um, and then, uh, and then once, it's, uh, once I know it's no longer going to drip, I can flip it up and you can see what the inside looks like. I've got two layers on the rim, two layers of glaze on the rim, one layer on the inside, and one layer on the bottom, right? So where those glazes overlap. I have the problem with this technique, I've got a little bit of glaze on my fingers. Before I accidentally, like, scratch my nose or something, I'm going to get that washed off of there. At the end of glazing, if you've got some on your hands, go wash, well, even if you don't, go wash your hands with soap. Uh, we also have three, three boxes of three different sizes of gloves. So if you're particularly concerned or you think you might get it on your fingers, go put on a pair of gloves. All right, another way that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to wax the bottom of this, aren't I? Um, so my brush is now soft, and I'm going to show you guys how, uh, how I'm going to put this in. Um, and I'm going to show because I'm not sure you can see. So I'm going to set this. Will that work? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, set this piece into the, the wax. The wax is at warm, so it's not spitting or anything. As I set it down, it'll basically glaze the foot. Or, I mean, wax the foot, excuse me. Um, but if I do it real fast, if I just go like that and I'm done, the bottom's going to be kind of bumpy. I'm holding it over there so it uh, doesn't drip. Um, also, if you are, if you, if several people are waxing together, it's a good idea for your own sake to get your bisque wear out of here because you don't want that jerk who brings their stuff across yours to drip all over yours. The only way to get wax off the bottom of a piece is to hook it, put it in the kiln until it burns off. Because it have both kinds of wax, this this hot wax and the pink wax, they both absorb into the into the piece, um, into the porous clay. And, uh, and even if you scrape it off or wash it off, it's not coming all the way off. All right, so look at the, the top of, or the bottom of this, the, the surface of this. See how bumpy it is? And how, it's got little holes in there. So when I go dip this in the, in the glaze, the glaze is going to get inside those little holes, and then I'm just wasting wax that's, gonna, that's just going to burn off in the kiln. So instead of just dipping it in like that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it in there, 
and then immediately as I pick it up, I'm going to use that brush to smooth that, that surface off. Um, and actually, this one, because I walked around so long, I'm actually going to hold it in there a moment longer so it melts back down. And then I'll do one the right way. All right, so I'm going to rub my, my brush along that inside edge and along that foot in particular. And because the, the brush had wax on it, the brush is, or the surface is now smooth. And so I don't have a little bu bunch of little holes that I'm worried about. I'm going to do one more the right way. All right, so I'm going to set it in there and then just immediately brush it with a brush. Saves you a ton of time if you do it that way. All right, so I'm running out of space. <laughs> um, when you are done with this hot wax, put the brush over here. You can't really wash it. Turn it off. The off is marked with a little um, uh, red dot, so you know where it is. And unplug it. All right? Um, if it gets too hot and starts spitting, we'll unplug it. Same kind of deal. All right, so a couple other ways that we can glaze these guys. So this one has the pink wax on it. I'm going to do a full dip. Now, I'm using these tongs to keep the glaze, to keep, my, keep my hands out of there. And where these tongs touch, they're going to just touch in uh, like four little points, like that. Before you, when you first use the tongs, make sure you got a good grip. You don't want to be cranking down on that because you will snap through the clay. Um, uh, you also want to make sure your pot doesn't have a real thick to real thin spot or just a really skinny spot because you can crank down and crack that. So what I always do is I kind of set it and then I just kind of hold my hand here for a second so I'm not scared of swinging it around. I also wouldn't recommend swinging it around. So I'm going to dip it in this one. This is a nice thick glaze so I can go real fast, one, two, three, and out right away. I'm tipping it back and forth because Either water will pool in my foot or water will pool in my bowl part, so I'm going to tip it back and forth so it doesn't do that. Notice how nicely that pink wax kept most of the glaze from sticking, but it wasn't perfect, right? So I will have to come back with a, with a uh, wash, um, sponge in a little while. Alright, so I've left tiny little holes there, and of course I was not careful, so I scratched it. Those holes will go away. The glaze will dry on here fairly quickly, like I, like happened with this, this one that I glazed twice. The glaze will not dry on these guys. So if you're going to use tongs, you're using them for the same glaze. There's several pairs of tongs, so you can have a couple out. And you make sure we know what this is. If you find tongs or other tools up here on the table and you're not sure what they go to, go wash them off. Washing off over here, we have a glaze wash bucket. You start to wash in the glaze wash bucket. And then you move to the sink. Leaving them in the sink or on the counter does not count as washing them. Right? Okay. You can tell I have a lot of problems with people not washing things. All right, this one I'm going to do a slightly different way. I don't want to bother to get tongs out, so I'm going to do a, uh, two dips. I'm going to dip the half of it like that. Notice how fast I went. And I'm going to let this side dry up a little bit. There's one other method I can do, and I don't want to do another one, so I'm going to show you what I did with the other class. If I can find it. There it is. So this one here, I didn't wax the bottom. I just stuck the whole thing into the bucket of glaze. And then I came back with a, a, a word, sponge, with a wet sponge, and I just wiped away all, I mean, I started to wipe away it. I'm not done. But I started to wipe away the glaze here and under here. So wax is optional. You do not have to use it. It's a resist. It helps keep the glaze from sticking, but it doesn't magically keep any of the, the glaze off. If you take your piece and you, say, accidentally get some on the foot... Sorry, I keep losing where, where my pieces are. Anybody know where the one I just... There it is. So if there's a little bit of wax here, or even if there's some wax on the... some glaze on the table and you set it down, and you end up with some wax underneath, or some glaze under, on top of the wax, what's going to happen in the kiln is the wax is going to burn off long before the glaze melts. And so the glaze will just sit there in between the foot and the floor, and when it comes time for the glaze to melt, that little bat patch, patch of glaze will melt, and it will stick to the shelf and to your pot. So even if it's not your fault, even if you used wax, even if you think it's clean, go over it again um, underneath with a, with a cloth. When you are done with these pieces, so when their bottoms are clean, 
this guy's bottom, let me check his bottom. This guy's bottom is clean. When you are done, and you've glazed it, and you don't have any mess ups, and it's not too thick, and all these sorts of things, then you will take it over there, and you will put it on the glazed ware cart to be bisque fire. I mean, to be glazed fire. Glazed ware cart to be glazed fire. If you put this on the bisque cart, I will bisque it, and you won't be very happy because that's not hot enough for this glaze to melt. Um, if you put it on the fired work cart, we will just look at it periodically and laugh at you. Uh, <laughs> um, so make sure it goes on the right cart. Um, also, check the, the cart where you're setting it down. If you set it down in a puddle of somebody else's glaze, and you get glaze on your foot, I'm going to bounce your pot, not theirs, because it's your, yours has glaze on the bottom. So check. If you see the shelf over there has glaze on it, go get a towel and wipe it off, because every time somebody puts a piece on there, they're going to collect more glaze. Um, things I'm looking for in pieces when I go to load. I want to see, this is functional pottery, so we're going to have glaze on the inside, we're going to have a glaze on, uh, well, certainly a glaze on the outside, or inside. Op outside is optional, it's up to you. We don't want glaze on the foot, and we don't want glaze thick down at the bottom. Now, the thickness I have here is probably a decent thickness. Um, if it's a glaze with a lot of flow, these little dots that I'm seeing here will tell me that it's getting a little thick and it's going to start to run. This piece, I'm probably going to clean up a little higher on the foot right here with a sponge, or I can score it with a knife and take it off, just in case, just because I don't want to risk uh, drips happening. Um, and then I can go put this on the shelf. If I see cracks happening in the glaze, that's a pretty good sign that it's too thick. If it's cracking off, it's too thick. You're going to have to go back and do it. Uh, redo it. If you end up with a glaze that you don't like, like, oh man, I put this glaze on it and I just, I hate what this glaze looks like or it wasn't the color I thought it was going to be, you can actually take it over to the glaze wash bucket, um, that green bucket over there by the sink, and you can wash the whole thing off. Now, because the clay, the whole reason glaze sticks to clay, or glaze sticks to ceramic, excuse me, is because the ceramic is porous and the water absorbs in. If you wash this off, you have to wait 24 hours before you can glaze it again, because the glaze won't, water won't absorb. But you can do that. So if you make a mistake, you can, or if you just change your mind, you can, it's no loss, it's fine. The, um, the bucket over here, the glaze wash bucket, the reason we wash stuff there first is so we don't have, we're not wasting a lot of glaze down and putting it down the sink. At the end of the quarter, we'll collect all that, <coughs> all that glaze that's sitting in the bottom of the glaze wash bucket, that left over from this and this and this and this, and we'll turn it into the garbage glaze. So the garbage glaze, the one back here that's called garbage glaze, it has whatever glazes, a mixture of glazes. All right, a couple other things you guys can do with your glazes that some people enjoy. Um, you can take uh, one of these kind of things, or there's, uh, here they are, baby medicine dropper thingies. Baby eyedropper thingies, you know, they give them to you at the pharmacy, so I bring them in here. You can take this sort of thing and you can do some little decorative uh, drips. You can tell this is a different glaze than I started with, can't you? Do you see what I mean? Pink and red? Mm -hmm. and, well, it, it'll show up more when, I, when it's done. Um, but regardless, you can do drips like that um, for decoration. I often tell... Sorry. Usually don't have quite so much stuff out. I get too classy for this. You could do decoration in the inside like that. You could work with a brush, um, a nice brush for drawing lines and things like that in your pot. Is this one here? The nice thing about this is that I can take and get a lot of glaze on the whole brush, and then I can do a line that goes thick to thin. I mean, I don't have a particular plan, but I can, I can decorate like that. You, it is possible to brush glaze on. So this, this rim I was doing for the other class, and I was showing them how to brush it on. One of the things, if for some reason you decide to brush glaze on instead of dipping, for you guys, most of the stuff I'd recommend dipping, just because it's easier, or dipping in and doing a little bit of pouring or something like that. Um, next time, on Wednesday, I'm going to show you guys how to use a spray booth, which is a slightly different way of glazing stuff, particularly useful for large stuff. Um, but painting is another method. Um, the problem with painting, though, is notice what happens as, as I brush my, my stroke across here. The glaze is pretty thick here, it gets thinner here, and then the second time I brushed with that, on the same side of the brush, it, it's even thinner. And it looks okay here, 
But a better technique is to layer these over the top of each other like that. And notice that I keep going back to the um, bucket of glaze because I want to have that as, as thick as I can get it um, or as, as even as I can get it really, which means thicker than what the brush is going to kind of naturally do. Alright, so to give you a sense of what it looks like if you do not do what I just said, this piece here had, uh, so it's got a white slip here, this is the raw clay, and then the whole thing from here to here at least has been brushed with the blue glaze. Looks like they dipped the blue glaze here and they brushed it here. But look at these brush strokes, they're thick and then they get thin through the middle. They, they're thick where they overlap, and then they get thin all through those middle sections. So we end up really streaky and messy looking. So this is how not to brush glazes on, unless for some reason you want that effect. Um, this is another example that I show you of what not to do. So this one has, um, a, has been glazed, and then, um, so they, they poured the glaze in, they poured it up, and then they brought it back up like this while it was still wet and runny. You notice that I held it upside down when I did a rim dip or when I dipped the outside. I held it upside down because it is impossible to go from this to this without going through this stage in the middle. And in this stage in the middle, the glaze is, ends up running sideways. So you get these streaky lines. This one looks fine because the glazes are all, or the lines are all running down. But that other one looks a mess because they're all running sideways. All right. So I'm giving you a lot of information today. I'm going to give you two more pieces of information uh, today besides cleanup. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll keep everything else for the, for the next time. One of those is flashing, and I forgot to tell the other class about this. So this, not our class clay, right? How can you tell? It's white, and our class clay is not white. However, this is a really good illustration. I'll show you this glaze on, on our class clay. This is the same glaze on this section as on this section here. The blue is something different. But um, all this section, all this section, this is the same. Actually, here's a perfect example. This is all one dip of the same glaze. Except the rim. <laughs> this glaze is called Faffy's Copper Red. And when Faffy's Copper Red is in a reduction atmosphere, it turns red. Uh, think of a copper penny in your pocket that kind of coppery, darker color. When Faffy's copper red, when copper is, an ox it is in an oxidation atmosphere, the copper turns kind of green. Think of the Statue of Liberty, right? What that copper looks like on the outside. Um, the, we can control the oxidation and reduction atmosphere in the kiln. Reduction means we reduce how much oxygen there is in the kiln. Just like a penny in your pocket, you're reducing how much air is available because your pocket is closed. Um, out in the bay or, or in the water, there's lots of oxygen available. We can make the kiln fire in such a way that we give, their, we give lots of oxygen into the kiln. Normally our kiln is fired more of a reduction atmosphere, but it can go a little bit towards the other, the other side of things as well. This piece, the way they were able to have both an ox, a reducing and an oxidizing atmosphere in the same piece, in the, obviously fired in the same kiln, is the way they loaded it. So this piece was loaded really close to another I move things. Really close to another piece on this side. And then the other pieces around it were loaded fairly loosely. So there was lots of space over here and then it was tight over here. We can actually control our kiln two ways. We can give lots of space around it. We can also control how much I, I literally have a dial for gas and a dial for air. And so I can turn the dial for either of those up or down. Um, if you want to get stuff into that red look, this is a heavily reduced uh, uh, Faffy's Copper Red glaze on our class clay. Notice that they got it too thick. Faffy's Copper Red has a tendency to do that. This section right here was more oxidized. So probably this was a gap in the kiln. There's probably stuff close by here and, and not over here for some reason. Um, but we've got two glazes that react to the atmosphere in the kiln. The Faffy's Copper Red and the Portage Glacier Blue. Which was, here it is. Um, Portage Glacier Blue also has copper in it. The, and it has copper and it has blue. So this is it in an oxidizing atmosphere where the copper turns greenish. So it basically looks, the blue is overpowering. So it basically looks blue. 
Here it is, kind of this section and this section here, in a reducing atmosphere where the copper turns red. Red plus blue equals purple, so that's why we get this purpley kind of look happening in the Portage Glacier Blue. I did not name them, so Portage Glacier Blue in our class, in our kiln, mostly is going to be Portage Glacier Purple, but it already has the name Portage Glacier Blue. I don't know. That, that's how everything's like. Um, and then this one is Temoku, so it's just a different place. All right. So do we tell you if you want it oxidized or um, if you want a certain color? If you want it, so, so in the class this size, I mean in three classes this size, this quarter, we might do one, or we might do one oxidizing firing. So in general, we are assuming that it's going to be reducing. If you want to try to oxidize it, which is the unusual thing, you talk with me, and either I'll say, oh, yeah, a bunch of people want to do that. We'll fire an oxidizing kiln. Or I say, okay, we'll try to put yours in a, sp a spot in the kiln. So right before we, be we end. So you are done glazing, um, and, uh, and you uh, are ready to go. If there's any hyenas available, you give them the work. But otherwise, you've got to take care of this. You're going to wash off, get as much of the glaze off the stick as you can. And then you're going to come over here to the glaze wash bucket. This is the stick wash bucket. When you've got a dirty stick, you start in the glaze wash bucket. You can use the brush to clean it off. This glaze gets re or this water gets recycled, and then we can wash it in the sink at that point.